that's a silent auction. Isn't that brilliant? brilliant? Wouldn't that be so, so fun to set up your own mini golf? Yeah, you just fun, like go all over the building. <laughs> so fun. So split 701. All right, I think we can uh, probably get started. Thanks for coming out, um, and I'm glad the first day of spring. How good is that? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad it's not a rainy night, or else we'd kick you all out and make you go put on your rain gear and come out to the road and, and just get right down to it. Uh, I'm Amy Green. I'm the conservation agent in Littleton. I'm also on the conservation commission in Acton. This is Scott Smyers uh, with Oxbow, and he'll do himself some more later, and Bettina Abe, who's in the, uh, the Acton Natural Resources for a little while yet. Conservation. They, we got changed our name That's right, you did change your name. Yeah, I like natural resources better. Same thing. Um, so I was uh, going to get things started, but first a little public service announcement while I have a captive audience. If any of you are interested, we're doing a Weed Warrior program, which is looking for volunteers to help us pull invasive species, um, primarily off of, of town lands. And it's also got a big training component, so you will understand what you're looking at and how you might be able to attack the invasive species on your properties as well. So if anybody wants to sign up for that, you can either talk to me or Tim, the assistant conservation agent in the back corner over there. Um, and we can kind of just get you on a list so you can do it as you will with that. Um, so we're, I'm going to start off talking about the amphibian crossing brigade to start. Um, and uh, this basically started in 2018. I was out on uh, the Littleton side of Fort Pond Road looking at a vernal pool. And I came out around midnight um, onto Fort Pond Road, and it was kind of a slaughterhouse. Um, I forget how many dead I saw, but I know I, know I counted seven spotted salamanders. So I'd, I'd always wanted to do a brigade, and I figured, well, this is the perfect place to do it. So I teamed up with Bettina very quickly. So we you know, can cover the whole act in Littleton side of Fort Pond. And then we dragged Scott in when we started needing some, some professional help, some professional biologic help um, to get us moving on that. So we, we've done it every year since then. And here we go. Can you guys all hear? Do you want her to use a mic? Nope. You can hear? OK. Uh, the mic is on, but oh. it might not be loud enough. So flag me down if you can't hear. Um, so on, um, on both of our websites, oh, actually, I think your link is broken. Uh, we have the handbook, which describes what we do. Um, the main focus, actually, of the handbook is really on the safety, both the safety for the amphibians. So you know, keep your hands clean. Don't be using mosquito repellents um, because their skin will absorb it. And then safety for you because these are open roads um, at night in the rain. So you definitely need flashlights so you can see what you're doing as well as any other safety gear you have for, for nighttime. Um, we usually go out this time of year, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Um, I tend to get there a little before dark myself, um, so I can do a lap before things get started and know what's going on before it all just gets dark and I can't see anything. And then people stay as long or as short as they want to. They can, everybody can come in at 8 o'clock. You can come in at 10 o'clock. If you're a night owl, you can stay till midnight. So. Um, for me, traffic starts dying down around 8 or 9, and I'm pretty fried by then anyway from walking up and down. Um, thank you. No, I'm double mic'd, so <laughs> we're going to get some feedback going here. Yeah. So the main place we go is uh, Fort Pond Road, and what we ask people to do is either park on the south side, um, which is in Acton, just off Newtown Road, or do not drive through Fort Pond Road, drive all the way around, and come in from the north side and park on the side of the road um, there. And there will be signs uh, that you can see there that are out that kind of show you where to try not to go past. So you can park before you see those signs. Um, and the signs are up. I put them up this weekend, some of them anyway. If you go onto the Littleton website, there's a, a page there. It'll give you all sorts of information about vernal pools. Um, that you can follow links on if you want to get more identification sheets about what you're looking at. Um, if you want to see some of the other slideshows, uh, there's some good slideshows on there, and they also have sounds in them, so you can listen to what a peeper is versus a, a wood frog or something like that. And also on the web page is a summary of what we found in the past years. Um, I didn't keep track on in 2018, but 
Uh, you all, I think I probably recognize some of you people have been out there, and thank you very much, and hope to see more of you out there, um, have crossed over a thousand amphibians um, in, in these efforts. Uh, most of them are wood frogs, that's the most common one, and then peepers, uh, and you get your spotted salamanders, um, maybe 10, 15 a year, no, probably more than that. It, it depends how often we go out and if we happen to hit a peak. Um, Bettina's seen the, uh, the four-toed salamanders, which I'm very jealous of because I have not yet. Um, and redbacks. And redbacks, yes. <laughs> Who shouldn't really be there, but I think they just join the herd and, and move along with us. Yeah. Um, and we also have the Jefferson Complex out there that, that Scott will talk a bit more about. And he'll be going through what all these things are. Um, and then what do I do with it? Uh, the information, my main focus is, is the rescue. Just get them across the road, try to, to cut down on the mortality as, as much as we can. Um, can you show us on the map where they're trying to get to? Or where they're coming from? Maybe. So, <coughs> most of the poles that you, that you can see from the road are gonna be on the east side of Fort Pond. Mm -hmm. And there's a bigger one up in here. There are ones back in here that are more hidden. So we mostly see them going this way. But if you see someone moving and they're going that way, carry them that way. Don't say, no, they're going to pull somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's stupid frog. <laughs> there, you know, there's some cross traffic. And actually, at, at some, sorry. That's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, which way the frogs go? Which oh, way which way to go? And and depending on how the year is, and if if it's if it's really stretched out the migration, you actually might find some that are starting to head back out, you know, away from the pool. You know, they're they're done. Thank you very much. They're moving off. So, like I said, besides the rescue, um, I do report the data that you all collect when you're out there. Um, there's two places. There's the Heritage Hub, which Mass Wildlife runs. Um, and what I mostly use those for is for the, uh, an animal observation report. If we do find um, a Jefferson complex or something a little bit more unique, um, I will fill one of those out. And then uh, that's also where if you get into vernal pool certification, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. I think you're going to touch on it yeah, well, a little bit. It's like a whole separate thing. But this is also where you would um, report those. So I've done three off of Fort Pond. Um, I didn't do all, go on any private property. I did on the Littleton Conservation Trust property, excuse me, back in 2020. And this year I hope to at least look at pools at, in Littleton on Browns Woods, uh, Oak Hill, um, Town Forest, and then off Bulkley Road. Um, so hopefully there'll be some more that get certified in there. And the other place I report is something called linking landscapes that uh, DOT and Mass Wildlife all do. Um, and that's an extremely simple form. Um, so, which is why, you know, and it, so it's got the count. So I would give them a count of an entire night. You all go out and you say, I saw 23 wood frogs. I'll add them all up and I'll send it in for the night. Um, so that data is there. And um, I only, only have time and, and energy to do this time of year. But this can happen almost all year, certainly through the summer. Uh, so if any of you have, you know, the, the desire to keep doing this after I quit, have at it. Um, and, and Scott can tell you a little bit more about that, too. And I think that was basically all I wanted to say. I did want to mention um, there's an author out in Concord who's about to, uh, well, actually next spring, I guess, is publishing a child book on vernal pools, which I think is just, I love the artwork on this. Um, but she's very interested in also sort of the citizen science side of this thing. So it's not necessarily biologists, well-trained people going out. It's, it's just people in the room here. I didn't know much about vernal pools when I started this, and I'm still learning. Um, so you can take it as far or as not far as you want to do um, on it. And that's it. <laughs> All right. And we also that's added um, Arlington Street. Yes, yes. So I started volunteering with Amy, and then a couple years later, um, I was like, I just have this feeling that Arlington Street's going to have a lot of crossings. And 
So we park in the church parking lot on the corner of Arlington and Newtown. It's a big parking lot there. And we patrol from that corner to the Route 2 overpass. And there are vernal pools on both sides yeah. and just tons of animals crossing. So any help you want to give us for that street too. And, and Arlington is, is a little scarier. It's a faster road <laughs> um, than Fort Pond, which is a, well, it is a bit of a cut through. Um, and, and Reed and, and others are also doing a depot road in Boxborough, so they could always use some, some help out in Boxborough, I know. Um, Jonathan split off and is doing Bolton. Either Harvard or Groton has their own crossing, so depending on where you are closest to, you probably find something nearby if you wanted to. And on Arlington, they're going in all directions. It's absolutely crazy. As are all the cars. If they were born in one pool, they're going to go back to that pool, and they were born in another pool. Born is kind of the wrong word, I guess. Well, yeah, they come from that part. Yes. Yeah. So you really do have to yeah. protect yourself when you're out on Arlington Street and just don't Yeah, it's not a place for little kids. Don't yeah, no little yeah. kids, but don't assume anyone can see you. If you hear a car coming, just stare at it so you can jump up. With your headlamp so you blind. Them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you really should have some high visibility reflective gear on if you're yes. going to be out on the roads and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I just really want to thank uh, Amy and Bettina for coordinating this over the years. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> uh, you sucked me into another year. <laughs> yeah. And I, I enjoy going out and, and doing this. Um, I think I'm going to stand up while I'm... Do you mind yeah, sure. advancing my slides? And I say next slide. All right. I don't know. Is that all right? That's good. But you know they've done a lot of work on this, and I think one of the neat things about it is the uh, community part about it. You know the the people. I mean, I'm really into the biodiversity of the animals, and I'll go out there late at night when there's really no traffic because the weather's good, and I might see something then. You know, um, and I encourage other people to do, do the same thing. There's less traffic, less risk to both you and the animals, but you might find something really interesting. Um, but when you're out there, when there is a little bit of traffic and there is people that are interested when the rain is you know, good, you, you'll find families with young kids out there. They got their buckets and their little shovels and they're helping the amphibians along, you know, so they can scoop them off. Or their spatula, they'll have yeah. a spatula and a bucket. <laughs> got their whole kit and they'll tell you how many they saw, wood frogs and peepers. And so I think that's really important to get that into young people and families and it's just something that we can come together around that a lot of people anyway, not everybody, I guess, but a lot of us are like, you know, frogs and salamanders are pretty neat. You know, how they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. They were here before we were here. They got around this landscape, you know, during ice ages and the periods between ice ages and then another ice age. And then here we are with, you know, humans on the landscape too, and they're still persisting and they're still out there. They're sensitive, but also very durable in a lot of ways, right? So that's what makes me interested in them. And so oh, I'm going to talk about different types of vernal pools. I think this is a cool example of a pond that I like to go to up in Vermont. And you can see in the early spring, it's all full of water. The leaves are just coming out on the trees, but really not a lot of green growth along the shoreline. And then as it goes down through the summer, it's a completely different habitat, right? It's not totally dried up. But that water is really shallow, doesn't have any fish in it, uh, and then that marshy habitat is all around it, and it can, can provides a different type of terrestrial wetland habitat. So they're very dynamic through the course of just one year. Next. Um, this is a, a woodland type of vernal pool that's typical of like central mass. I think this is from like northern Worcester County in Ashby, very rocky and uh, kind of black water. Next. This is the top of Wachusett Mountain. Doesn't look very natural, but I assure you that this pond's been here for thousands of years and somebody just built a wall around the edge of it about 100 years ago. Um, and that has spotted salamanders that breed in that pond, but it also has hundreds of goldfish in it that humans have put in. And many years ago, I worked with people to get rid of the goldfish, and we did, and it was a big success. And then the next year, somebody put more goldfish back in it. <laughs> And so it's a never-ending thing. Uh, and here's a, uh, uh, you know, this is what we see the pools looking like right now, right about the time when the amphibians start to breed and migrate when still some ice on them, uh, but the forest is mostly bare. Next. 
And so seasonal ponds, vernal pools, I like to call them seasonal ponds because vernal pool means it fills up in the spring. There's autumnal pools that fill up in the fall. So there's like different, uh, you know, sub definitions, but seasonal pond covers them all. They dry up. So they're fishless. That's a big predator in these ponds. And so there's a specialized niche for a lot of these amphibians that can't handle that type of predation and a lot of insects that specialize in that type of habitat too, that have a larval period that, that is, uh, has to be aquatic. Um, and typically they're discrete populations and they depend on one pond. They breed early in the spring, uh, deposit their eggs in the pond, the larva feed and grow and develop, and then they go through metamorphosis and head into the uplands, hopefully before it dries up, right? Um, and that's the big race every year is when that pond's going to dry up and can they finish their larval period before that. And the adults are often faithful to one pond for breeding for their whole lives. Like we were talking about before on Fort Pond Road, you know, I see that every night that there's an amphibian activity, if there's some going this way, some going that way. I just say they're either going to Littleton or they're going to Acton. <laughs> because north and south isn't quite as convenient as you would like it out there. So um, next. But there's lots of other animals that live in and around the ponds. This is a spring peeper with a cool gray color, uh, green frog, which have the little ridges that come down their back, American toad. Um, I've got adult caddisflies. The larval caddisflies have little cases that they build and walk around in the water and feed on the leaf litter. Other species are predaceous. Ants, of course, and other insects, spotted salamanders, wood frogs, and garter snakes you'll find often on the edge what of pools. On the top middle? An, an ant. What is the, it's an ant. It's a gigantic ant. It's looking at it from the side. That's the back end of the head is on this side, and the gaster is on the other side. And it swims. Nope, it's just around the pond. Oh. You know? uh, I'm just trying to things. think about other, other things, too. Next. But if you're going to go out in the ponds or uh, to help with any sort of amphibian or uh, reptile work out here, it, you want to have some basic equipment. H waterproof boots is excellent. High, uh, high visibility vest, like I was talking about, a flashlight if you're anywhere near roads at night, thermometer, bucket, jars, a dish or tub uh, for putting your, what you catch in it, a net hand lens, camera, and a brush and cleaner. Remember, you're, if you go out a lot, which I encourage people to go out in the woods a lot, they get muddy, they get dirty, yay, I like that. Mm -hmm. But don't bring your mud and dirt from one place to another place. It could have seeds in it from invasive plants, it could have some sort of disease you don't know about. So you wanna clean everything between, don't bring a net that's got all sorts of vegetable matter from your last pond mm -hmm. to another pond, right? You wanna clean that out and a nice little boot brush will do the trick for most of that. Also, leaving things out in the sun is a really good way to, to just disinfect them, like all day long if you get a nice day, just dry your stuff out, especially boots and waders, stuff like that. Next. Here's a couple of wood frogs caught in amplexus when the male's on top of the female trying to convince her to lay her eggs. Mm -hmm. Next. Sometimes in the middle of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we do find them hopping around on land in Amplexus, but hopefully not laying their eggs. But here's a female laying her eggs, and hopefully there was a male nearby because they have external fertilization uh, a few minutes before that, so those were fertilized, I hope, but I'm not totally okay. sure. Underneath the water, it's a cool view looking at the wood frog eggs from underwater. Uh, you can see the individual embryos are round, so that means they're very fresh. Next. And, of course, spotted salamanders. These are, uh, you know, really interesting animals. They can live to be 25, 35 years old. Um, they uh, breed in the spring at the same time as the wood frogs, but you can't hear them calling because they don't call, right? So the only way to see them is to go out there in the rain, and that's when they're active. Nighttime, rain, more than 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and you have to actually find them walking around. Uh, and then they have internal fertilization without copulation. So what happens is the uh, males try to attract females in the bottom of the ponds with these dances that they do swimming around. And then if the female likes what she sees, 
She'll follow the male, and then he'll put down the spermatophore, a little packet of sperm on the bottom of the pond in leaf litter, which looks like this underwater, these little white flecks. You might see, you can see them in the daytime. And next, if you pull them out of the water, it looks like this. So I just use my net or grab the, the leaves, and you can see these little white patches, globs of salamander sperm. Uh, that were either used or not used by the by the females, but that's how they ha have fertilization. Next, and then a uh, few days later, they'll lay a, an egg mass, and this one on the left that's a spotted salamander egg mass, a fresh spotted salamander egg mass, and the one on the right is a wood frog egg mass. It's not quite as fresh, but there's a good difference in these the smooth characteristics along the whole outside of the egg on the spotted salamander. Although there's a bunch of individual embryos and eggs inside there, but it's all smooth on the outside, whereas the wood frog is bumpy, right? So that's something that you can always count on by telling the differences, all right? Ah, and then the blue spotted salamander, or the Jefferson salamander, uh, is a, a, a rarer species. It's listed as a special concern species. <clears throat> These two different species, the blue spot and the Jefferson hybridize, it's very complicated. Hybridiz hybridization, um, but we're stuck with it here in Massachusetts. And some of the populations actually have very few males in them at all, and the females actually just clone themselves, and they use the male spermatophore just to stimulate that, uh, 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 the development of their embryos, of their eggs, wow. and yeah, okay. the males don't actually contribute anything to it. So. It's, it, it leads to a lot of problems. <clears throat> There's a lot of dead ones that don't make it, right? But they've been surviving for millions of years here. And there are two populations, at least, <clears throat> of pure, or pure blue spots in southeastern mass and then pure Jeffersons in western mass. But everything else that has that hybrid is not only a hybrid of like one chromosome and another from the two parents and the recombination, but they'll have up to five <clears throat> chromosomes in those individuals. So it's completely different than a lot of things that we're used to dealing with as vertebrates. Um, and I'm not gonna get in too much in detail <laughs> more on that, but they're, they're neat and we sometimes see these out on Four Pond Road. Next. Most of the time you're gonna see females because of that story I just told you about how the, this is a female. Next. Here's a bunch of females. Why do you know Oops. they're females? because they're almost exclusively females because you just don't find that many males and the males are much smaller and skinnier. And these ones are plump, plump and full of eggs. Mm -hmm. Now here's a four-toed salamander. This is the mother four-toed salamander over here. And then she's guarding her eggs, these little circles right here. And they're underneath the sphagnum moss. So this, that puffy, pillowy moss that we see in forested wetlands and where, where it has to overhang standing water, like a six inches, a foot, two feet of standing water. So when those eggs hatch, they wriggle down through the moss and can drop into the water and s swim away. So they're very specific habitats. So if you know that and you know what time of year to go look for them, you might be able to find them. And like we said, sometimes you actually find these in, uh, in, in crossing roads on rainy nights too. So that's a good way to find it as well. Um, they also have a constriction at the base of their tail, which is neat. So if the predator comes up to them, they can detach their tail easily. It wriggles. The predator gets distracted with that, and the salamander hopefully gets to live another day. Yes? How far north do these guys? Four-toed salamanders? <clears throat> yeah. How, can you find them in I think New they, Hampshire, Maine? Yeah. Vermont, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> Maybe even Canada, I think. Nova yeah. Scotia, yeah, that's the northern area. Okay, area. yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're around. So uh, they're breeding cycles the same time as the other one? As it's a little one. bit later, okay. usually in May. And another interesting behavior they have is uh, communal nest guarding. So when one female will come and lay 20 to 30 eggs, and that's a good spot to lay eggs. Like I said, there might only be so many spots that are, have that overhanging feature with the moss. So another female will come to the same spot. She'll lay her eggs and then the first female will leave and that second female will guard the eggs. And we've found as many as like 300 eggs. So probably like 30 females in one spot, but only one female is guarding all those eggs. 
what they're guarding them from, nobody knows. Is it like beetles or fungus or bacteria? Sometimes they might just, if, if some of the eggs get contaminated, they'll just eat them, you know, um, with some salamanders. But with this, we're not, not quite sure. So There's a lot of theories. A swamp, right? Definitely in a swamp. Yeah. or It could be a vernal pool, but, but swampy characteristics too. Um, next. Marbled salamanders, mm -hmm. which is another rare one that we have. This one breeds in the fall. It, and, it, and it can come and breed and lay eggs in a pond that's dry as it lays its eggs along the edge of a pond that only fills up in the fall. Remember I mentioned that before, the autumnal ponds? And then when the water fills up to where those eggs are, it floods the eggs, it cuts off the air circulation across the membrane of the egg, the embryo in there starts to twitch and hatch and, and, and escapes the egg and swims away. But if they lay them too low, it could flood and then dry out again, mm -hmm. lay them too high, might never flood. So it's this interesting mm -hmm. selection of habitat. Next. Here's, they have this beautiful white yeah. and black pattern. Next. Or marbled salamander pictures. Ah, and then the red eft or red spotted newt is another common salamander that we have. The Northeast is not necessarily vernal pool related. It actually has toxins in its skin, so it can do quite well in ponds with fish because the fish start, take a bite out of them and get sick and decide not to eat them again, so they leave them alone. Um, but, but, but they're common in the landscape, and they have a similar type of uh, life cycle, except that the juvenile phase is often this reddish, very, or orange color and they have a drier skin, and then they, when they mature, they become more that olive-colored and uh, moist skin. Next. Here's a spring peeper uh, sneaking out of the, the moss and mm -hmm. trying to attract some mates. Next. And gray tree frogs, we ought, do see those on Four Pond Road, too. I've seen them a few times. They're a wonderful frog. They breed a little later, probably mid-May to mid-June. Next. And they can change colors. They're the only Incredible. only amphibian that can do that in, around here. Um, they got the suction cup toes and can go way up trees. Next. And the spade foot toad. We don't have those in Acton that I know of. It would be exciting if we could find them. But they're a very interesting small toad that occurs like on the Cape and then out in uh, Western Mass in some places, a couple of places in Middlesex County. But they can dig into the sand good, uh, and they can spend a long time waiting for the right conditions underground. Next. And one of the things I'm really interested in is looking at variation in populations. That's why I think that a project like this with a lot of people that come out and look in one place, to, to you it might be like, oh, we're protecting them from the road. I'm, I'm thinking this is a perfect biological transect. You know, This cuts across this landscape somewhat arbitrarily. And I can document as many things as I can in this one, one area. It's a, it's a neat way to just study uh, one place. Um, so, but you know, these peepers can be really variable in appearance, but also in their calls, too. They, they have Some places will have higher pitch calls than, and lower pitch calls, I've learned from some of my research I'll tell you about in a minute. Next. But you know, even just looking at American toads, you see them in different colors. But sometimes that's just because they were sitting out in the sun for a few hours and they can turn really dark that way. You know, if you let them sit somewhere else, they, 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 they turn back to a slightly different color. Next. And green frogs, I think they're really neat. They have a ton of variation in their color patterns and sizes. I don't know if you can see, but this one is eating another green frog. He has in his mouth. <laughs> <clears throat> Next. But some of them are this really light green color. Next. And then we have insects too, you know, caddis flies. I mentioned those before, but this is one of the cases. This builds it and it, it sticks these little pieces of, of, of wood or stones together with, with silk, like a spider silk, and constructs this, this case and drags that around with them. It uses it for both protection, camouflage, and also somewhat circulation so they can like move their body and get the water to go through against their gills on the sides of their body too. Next. And here's one next to a pencil, a little bit different construction. Wow. Next. Hmm. And, and, and this is you know, a few different organisms here. We have a green frog tadpole. We have a damselfly larva. 
a spotted salamander larva, and then a caddis fly, but this is one of those caddis flies that's a predator. So it's probably thinking, ah, oh, these gills look delicious. I'll take a bite out of those. Mm-hmm. And then the, the salamander swims away. But I think what's neat too is I'm going to talk about photographs. And if you want to get involved in this, it's really good to be taking a lot of pictures. And there's really no excuse. Any day. Anyway, everybody has a pretty good camera usually mm-hmm. right on their hip, mm-hmm. right? But it's the lighting, it's the patience, it's demanding good focus, you know, those are sort of things. And then having a background like this, where you have like an actual scale, you can actually turn this photograph into something really useful to scientists and you can do some measurements. Next. But we also find sometimes fish in vernal pools. They're not necessarily breeding populations of fish, but this is a common redfin pickerel that we find and they swim upstream, take advantage of floods and get into get into backwater areas and often vernal pools. Next. And sometimes even these little banded sunfish I'll find in my traps. These are, I think, both from Acton on the Jenks land. Next. And then sometimes if you, if the uh, amphibians lay their eggs too high, they get, oh, the water's going down too fast before they can develop and it gets all stretched out. And, so the water level can, can, can you know, ha- have a big effect on, on the development. Next. Uh, but also the egg masses I wanted to show you with the blue spotted and Jefferson salamander, they have more flimsy and smaller eggs. Sometimes they even just lay the eggs in strings or individually, so they're almost impossible to find. Mm-hmm. But when you lift them up to the surface, not like a spotted, a spotted salamander egg, you lift it up to the surface when it's fresh and it sticks out like a baseball. Right? It's just, all right, um, it's very rigid. But these are flat, they flatten out and quite a, almost will go through your fingers. They're flimsy, so it's a different texture and construction, really. Mm-hmm. Next. And if you look really closely between their legs, you can somewhat tell that this is a male uh, blue-spotted salamander. Very small. Next. I don't think he appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, spotted salamander. Oh, I, no, I think I'm trying to show you this because there's some dead embryos here. So I remember when I said, yeah, at least that one. That one's dead. And up here, blue spotted salamanders, they have a lot of trouble with development because of that hybridization. So that's one of the best ways to find them is look around and find like, oh, there's a bunch of white spots. Oh, those are dead embryos. And then you, you, you can see the egg mass. Next. Here's some more egg masses that are more developed. And I wanted to point out that some of these spotted salamander egg masses will be opaque, completely like white color. You can't see the embryo serum. That's natural. It's not, it's just one of those things. Every once in a while, different populations, you'll have like 50 spotted salamander egg masses and eight of them will be white. You know, it's just one of those things. It just happens. It's both uh, natural, both genetic and diet related, I think. Next. So a little bit more about my research, so it makes a little bit more sense when combining it with the project here at Fort Pond Road, I think is a good thing. So, but it, overall, I just want to get people interested in documenting species and appreciating biodiversity. And I think that's a good mix with some of my research objectives. Is this a people- Who do you work for? I, you who I work you. for? Yeah, who, who, um, who funds the work and who? Well, I work, I'm a part owner of a company called Oxbow Associates. We do wetlands and wildlife work. But I do a lot of volunteer work that's related to what I do because I just can't get enough of it. So it's a little bit of, it's hard to, the lines are a little blurred, you know, but, uh, so I'm a professional biologist, Mm -hmm. but for stuff like this, nobody's paying me to do this particular, you know, uh, type of work, you know, but I'm glad to help and I'm glad to find other people who think it's a good idea too. Um, But yeah, documenting species, um, timing of the breeding and recording, uh, both recording audio recordings I'll talk about in a minute, but also just photograph recordings. Um, I'm very interested in the body size variation of both adults and and juveniles, uh, egg number and egg sizes between different populations, uh, embryos and larval development periods, Uh, size at metamorphosis, size and age at maturity, uh, and I want to do a lot of 
photography so I can get efficient, accurate data collection with live specimens um, and then be able to release them, right, as opposed to preserving them and then measuring them later. Um, and I'm mostly working on the common species like wood frogs, spring peepers, spotted salamanders, garter snakes, turtles, um, and studying different populations. Uh, next. So the recording devices, this is a, the song meter. Um, and it's a digital recording device that you can set out in the field. It's waterproof and you pre-program it to record at different times. It's programmed the location so it figures out when the sunset and sunrise is because that's important for especially for frog calls. You want to start your recording cycles, you know, an hour after sunset or so. Um, so we use these in a lot of different locations uh, and we learned a lot about when different species start calling, stop calling, when their peaks of calling are, and a few other interesting things, Just and, and what species are there, too, because you can't be there 24 hours a day as a person, right? But you can leave these there, and they can record, not quite 24 hours, well, they could if you wanted to, but I don't want them to record 24 hours a day, but a subsample of that time period. Next. But this is one of the habitats in, on Nantucket that we've been studying for a long time. Next. This is a cool pond, but it only has spring peepers and green frogs in it. It doesn't have wood frogs. They don't have wood frogs out there. They don't have toads out there. So it's a different type of ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Next. But for example, here's what peepers look like on, a, on the screen, <coughs> on the, the software. That's a chorus of peepers calling along there. Mm -hmm. And you can see, I can see what hertz they're calling at between 3,000 and 3,500 hertz. That was 2018 at midnight. Next. And then it go up way up to New Hampshire at about the same time. Uh, but it's in uh, Eagle Lake, which is on Franconia Ridge. You got wood frogs calling all down here. That's what those lines are. And then one peeper calling across oh. there, right there. <laughs> Next. Orchestra. The Lakes of the Clouds, which is near the top of Mount Washington. Uh, same sort of thing, peepers call it here, and then this, this line here is a uh, American token that's calling right there. And that's in the end of June, right? So we never hear peepers calling around here at the end of June, but up there it's still breeding season, right? Which is really neat to me. Next. And what we use for scoring the calls to try to figure out, okay, what's the most, what, what's the calling intensity of the now that we know what the species are, what's the calling intensity for that particular time on that date? So we use this method called the Wisconsin Frog and to Toad Survey. Next, and this is zooms in on that bottom. So we have like four call categories. Zero is no calls. One is individuals can be counted. But there is a space between calls, but there's no overlapping of calls. So beep, beep, like that sort of thing, right? <laughs> And then two, calls of individuals can be distinguished, but there is some overlapping of calls. And then three, a full chorus, calls are constant, continuous, and overlapping individual calls cannot be distinguished. So we score each one of these calling periods, what species they are, what intensity of, of, of calling they have. Next. And you end up with something like this. So this is Nantucket from 2010 to 2018, going from here to here, and the x-axis is about the same, call category is the same. So you can see sometimes they start calling in the middle to the end of March, but mostly it's the beginning of April. Again, beginning of April. This one was a little early, they got going, but then eh, I really got going in April again, but it was spaced out a little bit more. You know, very end of March. This one has an asterisk because I didn't get down there until like that day. And I set up the song meter that day. So it might have gone a little bit before, but probably not according to my sources. But then it's funny, the next year when I got down there plenty early, it didn't start until oh, okay. exactly that time period. Anyway, <laughs> huh. and 2016 was kind of early. 17, 18, a little bit early, but you know, it's mm -hmm. back and forth over like a two week period. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, want to keep keep doing this sort of thing if we can get enough people to help with the data entry and so forth. A question in the back. Do you think the variation in time is that more a function of temperature or <clears throat> rain when it's raining or? Both. Both. 
it has to be both. Yeah, it has to be warm enough and rain. Like if it if it's like 35 degrees and raining all night long, it's not quite warm enough for them. If, but if it's uh, you know 40 degrees and not raining and and it hasn't rained in days, it's really dry. It's still not going to do anything. So or the 50 degrees. Although some species like wood frogs will come out earlier if it really melts and it doesn't rain because they're right on the surface in the winter time and they don't burrow down very much and they will come out early. But um, it, it's really a combination of the rain and the temperature. Yes? Um, is there like an app or some way to record the sounds um, on your phone and then it identifies which frogs you're hearing? There's something like yes. that for birds, and I was wondering if there's one for amphibians as well. Yes, it's not instant, but I'm going to get to that in a little while. Super yes. Cool. Awesome. All right, next. Mm -hmm. And then this is a, a paper that myself and my colleagues wrote on uh, some of this frog call study of wood frogs, specifically in the White Mountains that just came out last year. So uh, calling phenology and, and wood frog at high elevation ponds in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. So that was a real a long time of 10 years worth of data that we put together for this particular paper. Um, and there's a lot more, more to do up there. It's a, it's a really interesting place. Um, but I'm going to bring us back to mm -hmm. acting. <laughs> Next. But, uh, you know, so we talked about the calling. We talked about the egg masses. And now a little bit about tadpoles and metamorphosis and photographing. So here's some green frog tadpoles. Next, it's great to get pictures of them in the water, but if you can get them out of the water and also get a picture of the belly, that's really helpful too, so we can see what that looks like and get some good close-ups. Next. And then a lot of what I do is take pictures of uh, amphibians on a scale with a grid background, so I can see exactly how much it weighs, and I know that the scale is flat and level, and I know that the camera is flat and level, and then I can use that picture for, for to, to measure things later. Yes? Um, you mentioned taking them out of the pond. How, how long is it safe to take a tadpole out of the water? That's a good question. Is if your hands, you know, everything should be wet that you're hand, hand, handling them with. So if your hands are wet, it's okay, you know, just for, uh, it's just long enough to take a picture and try to get them back in. But you can, like, put them back in your net with some wet leaves in there for a little while if you got to, like, get your stuff together. Get, yeah, so yeah, they can be a little longer. It can be a lot longer than that if you keep them moist in their natural conditions. I always have to remind myself to, before I go out on amphibian rescue, to wash my hands because if I have any moisturizer or hand cleaner, mm -hmm. you want to get all that off. Yeah. And then your hands feel really dry and you have to resist the temptation to <laughs> moisturizer on your hands. It's true, yeah. You don't want anything on There's plenty of wet leaves out there to get your hands yeah. wet again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rub your rain <laughs> pants. Yeah. 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 All right, next. And also try to you know be aware of your habitat around there. The ponds, especially get pictures of the, uh, like this pond is drying up, you know, but, uh, and so you get pictures of it at different, <coughs> different stages if you go back to the same place over and over again. Next. Yeah, and here's like, I think this is a spring peeper still with its tail. Next. There's one with the, you can start to see the X on the back there. Up. Oops, I think that's a wood frog, a little wood frog. Which one has the X? Peepers. Peepers. Yep, yeah. next. Yeah, a little blue spotted salamander. <coughs> next. Amy mentioned about the guy, the certification of rural pools. I just mentioned that too. If you get a lot of good pictures of egg masses and individuals that you find, or recordings of audio is, or video, you can use all of these to try to document your findings and get a vernal pool certified. If it isn't already certified, which you can find out before you go out there, but don't trespass on somebody's private property to do this. This is against the law and you could get in a lot of trouble. Next. And it's got these nice. Uh, data sheets that I think are quite useful, uh, but I won't go into them in detail. Two pages. Next. Yeah, so some more on photographs. It's great to get pictures in the water, but sometimes you have those reflections. It's not the right angle. Yeah, but try it. You should try it. Next. 
and then you can put it in a put put them in a container and get a picture like that too. That's can be useful like this. I can see. Oh, look, they still got little tail nubs. You know, they're just going through metamorphosis. So I can confirm that that they're wood frogs. Next. But if you get them in a little tray with a grid background, these are one-inch squares. This is a quilter's grid that I get from Amazon. It's like plastic. I can glue it onto the bottom of this little tray. You can use anything though, as long as you know what the scale is. And then you can float it right in the water, and that is often level, the water is, so then you can have a level surface. And then if you have a level on your camera, you can get a pretty level picture that's really useful. Um, so that can be good, next. And then you can zoom in, and here you can see this water measurer right here, so it's well, not only wood frog tadpoles, but this, this interesting insect. Next. Fairy shrimp. You can find those around. It's a female egg sac right there. Next. All right, try hitting, I think this should be a video. Will it work? Just hit next again. See if it... No. Yeah. Uh, no. All right. Well, fairy shrimp swim around. And if it's a, <laughs> if it's a fairy shrimp present, then it's instant certification. You don't need any other. They're an obligate species, yeah, yeah. Mm. and yeah, yeah, they're... So if, it, if it's an obvious vernal pool, it can be a very low bar to getting it certified? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's questionable, then there's a lot more to right. get into it. Basically, if you can get five egg masses, you can certify a vernal yeah. pool. That's the most legitimate way to do it, I think. Next. Uh, another vernal pool, I think that might be where those fairy shrimp were from. Next. There's another video that isn't going to work, probably. No, but egg masses on the grid background, you can see, so that they're still on the stick in the water, so I can you know, stick it in the water and then get a picture without disturbing it too much and, and get a, a more clear image and a rough estimate of the size and even maybe be, be able to count the eggs later. Next. Uh, spotted salamander egg mass, same sort of situation. Next. And fairy shrimp, but a little blurry. Oh, he's not oh that was the video. Yeah. yeah. And then just a few interesting places I've tried to take pictures like this. So this is near the top of Mount Washington, where I'm trying to set up my camera with a nice level surface to take a picture of those wood frog tadpoles and metamorphs. Mm -hmm. Next. And I gave up on the little table and just flattened it out there. Next. <coughs> Here's another location where there's a, 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 a three-sided shelter nearby that's actually pretty level. So I go in there and use that for my table. That works good. And then, yeah, this is just a demonstration where I have this external light, which I really like. You can get these lights. You know, there's all sorts of different kinds, but this one is not that expensive. And then you can hold that with your hand and get it right where you want it, no matter what. Then you have my bubble level on my camera. I got the levels over here to make sure this tray is level, and then I know everything's good to go, and I can just take my pictures. Yeah, it's very hard when you're out with a headlamp trying to take a picture because all you're getting is your shadow. Yeah, yeah, the headlamps are no good for yeah. pictures. Plus, yeah, you, if you have something separated, and even another person is what you really want, so yeah. you have some assistance. Yeah, and then I use like these little bubble levels to make sure that the scale is level before I start taking pictures. Mm -hmm. Next. And then I start taking pictures, like this little baby wood frog. That's 1.04 grams. Wow. Sometimes I even put them in a little container and flip them over, and I'll take a picture of their bellies, too, <laughs> so I can measure them more accurately. Next. So the road crossing, like Amy was talking about, um, you know, there's four real peri time periods. The first immigration is when it warms up to over 40 degrees with rain or fog or it's really heavy rain that happened like that afternoon um, so that's the immigration period sometime between march and april around here uh, and then in the summer uh, and then they come out a few weeks later uh, usually in april the adults going back to the uplands or back to the wetlands surrounding those areas but then later in the summer like july all the way through september that's when the metamorphs are coming out the Wood frogs will come out in July, but the spotted salamanders won't come out until August or even September, like I said. So uh, 
they, they might come out then, but then they're even harder to find. They're tiny, tiny little things, and they're crossing the road, you know, that's even mm -hmm. more of a challenge. But it would be worth going and looking around on rainy nights. And then the fall migration, any time between October and November, it seems like we get big rains at those, those time periods, and that's when a lot of amphibians just move around, get ready for winter, <coughs> maybe get to their final overwintering spots that they want to be at. Um, and then well, two other things on this is that inaturalist.org is a really important way to keep track of your observations, get identifications of species or uh, organisms you're not, you have no idea what they are, and, uh, and you can organize whole events on that, like our bio blitz we do at like Wachusett Mountain, we do it on iNaturalist. And then hygiene and safety, remember it's dark and rainy, is traffic, so the safety concerns, but also, like I talked about, with brushes and cleaning your equipment and that sort of thing. Um, that, yes, I see a question. Um, so for the four different critical time periods, are is only the one in March and April like a really like dense, like everything all at once goes, or uh, are all four of those different time periods also like uh, like large migrations over like a night or two? It depends on the weather, yeah. and it's pretty rare that the weather coincides to make it so it all happens in one short period of time, but it does every once in a while. But I like to try to get people's expectations realistic. Like, there are going to be times you go out and it doesn't rain as much as they said it was going to rain, or it rained and it got a little colder than they said it was going to get, or we hedged our bets and we said, all right, it's going to be 40 degrees and it ended up being 38 and it really makes a big difference that, and then, you know, so, but it's also, you tell people, go out, look around, you might find something because it's just like any, any other population of organisms, there's some that are kind of go-getters and they will go when it's colder, <laughs> you know, um, but, 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 but it's hard to, it's hard to totally predict, I guess. And, but those other events might, are like the metamorphosis, that's more dragged out, so it wouldn't be all at one time. Uh, and, but if it was very, if it is very dry for a long, long, long time, like it was this summer, mm -hmm. and then you get a rain, you're almost guaranteed to see oh. a lot of things at that yeah. time period. Have you seen the, um, in the emigration of the metamorphs, so that would be the salamanders? coming out of the dried up pool. Yeah. And the frogs, the wood frogs, baby wood frogs. And the frogs. Yeah. And so that's from July to September. Have you seen any itty bitty salamanders on Four Pond Road? No, I, no, no, and but I haven't really, really looked that itty, much. Like how itty bitty are they? Mm. They're, like, they're like half the size yeah, of the ones we yeah, rescued yeah. in the spring. Yeah, they're but they're so bigger than a peeper. Yeah. Yeah, a little I, longer. From the corner of your eye, if you see a peeper, sometimes think, was that a splash of rain or was that the frost? Oh, right. Yeah. 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 All right, next. So, yeah, we have the signs out there. You got to be careful about, uh, you know, don't, Amy mentioned the two parking areas. Don't drive through Fort Pond Road to get to the other parking area because the first parking area was, was full, you know. Uh, that's bad form. <laughs> and we'll drive all the way around. You know, I, I know it's a pain in the it's neck. It's a long way. It's a right long way, but I usually drive to the other side because yeah. it's a little better for me from where I live. But yeah, because you know you can't see the frogs and salamanders when you're driving. It, realistically, I, we don't want anybody who's trying to help them hurt them. Next, here we have some people in the background with flashlights. Next. It's more fun than trick or treat. Yeah. <laughs> Except it's raining. The yeah. signs in action. <laughs> Next. Yeah, a oh, couple of wood frogs we found on the road. Peeper on the road. You can see the X on the back of it. That is such oh, a good picture. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very clear. Next. Somebody looking for, a, you know, trying to save them. Just an action shot. <laughs> Next. Yeah, don't run in front of a car to save a frog. It is not worth it. <laughs> and that's the other safety Next. piece of it. Yeah, so iNaturalist. So I just did yeah. this like last night. So like I said, if, you have, if you're not on iNaturalist yet, you can upload sound files, like yeah. somebody yeah. was asking. And, you, and over time, somebody will identify them. Somebody just identified some insect sound I put up like 
three years ago yesterday. Yeah. So <laughs> it takes it might take a while for the yeah. sound yeah. stuff, but yeah, not all the right person. Yeah, yeah. But this is just I turned I did a search for this area for just the amphibians. And this is all the amphibians along Four Pond Road. Now maybe seventy percent of them are my observations, but not all of them. And there's a, a, a lot of good ones. So if you click on I I these things, and this is a much better use of your time than most social media things, if you're just like, oh, Lord, what's going on at Fort Pond Road? So, you, oh yeah, there's a few things here. Explore, activity, observe, me, and projects. So those are like the different categories you can get into in your iNaturalist account. Um, but I'm gonna go to the next slide and show there, you There's also someone, I don't, I don't know if you're here tonight, who works for Waze. And they now have a thing in ways where you can say if there's a road closure or an amphibia crossing. Not too many people were driving down Fort Pond Road and ways turned on, but you know. <laughs> and, if, and I'm an iNaturalist junkie, so if you want to see what the app looks like in my collection, just see me after and I'll show you what it looks like so you can get it. All right, all right, they're stealing my thunder. <laughs> this is what the app looks like. <laughs> Well, if you click on this, this is a wood frog, right? So that's me. That's how this is a wood frog, and then it shows you where it was. And if you clicked on this little button, it would show you like how many people said that they agreed it was a wood frog, or they thought it was a turkey. You know, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. It's a free, you know. But uh, that's that's how it looks, and I'll just show you. Uh, oh yeah, the date of this. So this is from March seventh, twenty twenty-two. So that's a little bit earlier than we're seeing wood frogs this year, this year, right? And I have them from there, from February 27th. Yeah, yeah. Was it the year before, or the year before yeah, that. that was, it was really it made, early. It made me insane. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was that was a really early one. But it was an, uh, it was another like false start. It was like, yeah, they're out yes. there, and then we got some snow. Yeah. Right. But anyway, next. There's another picture from from Fort Pond Road. Somebody found a spotted salamander. Next. Another one, somebody found one. And then this one's cool. This is the unisexual mole salamander, or the Obviously you've blue seen spotted it. salamander, one we were talking about before, but that's what they call them because of that hybridization thing. And if you click on the picture, just click on the next slide. And that's the picture there. I think that was your Yeah, it is. That was mine. Yeah. yeah, that was yours. So that was a pretty good picture, but the main thing is, you want to get good pictures, good in focus. You can get, you can put three, four pictures on mm -hmm. there. You could put a picture of a spring peeper and then a recording of the chorus of the spring peepers at the same time, in the same place. You know, so you can really fill in the context with it. It's really nice. And and we'll give you suggestions right away about what you might be looking at. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. It will it try to use for other people to agree yep. with you. But yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Next. So just a couple of references that I like. Sometimes people, oh, I want to learn more about amphibians and reptiles. I say, you should read this book, This Broken Archipelago by James Lazelle. It's a really neat book about the amphibians and reptiles of Cape, the Cape of the Islands. And it's old at this point, but people love it. Next. And then this, this is another good thing you can get from Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife for like 10 bucks. Um, or maybe it's more a little bit more now, but it's a great field guide to the animals of vernal pools. Um, and it's small, you can put it in your pocket. It's got a lot of good photographs in it, a lot of good information. Um, and I recommend it for anybody getting started on this sort of thing. And I think on, on our website, there's a link, I think it's to the Mass Audubon site that has a lot of the calls recorded. Yeah. So you can listen to them, which helps. That does help, yes. And then thank you. You know, follow the weather and get out there in the pools. Think about big night as a little bit of a gimmick, right? It's, it doesn't always happen. I just am tired of people. Is tonight the big night? I, know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it was last night. <laughs> yeah, right. But sometimes you can't have really big nights. So don't get me wrong. Yeah. But but it, uh, the weather and then people are like, well, I mean, I'm not going to stay up till 11. But it's not going to rain until 11. So it's probably not going to happen until then. And you wouldn't believe how many right. steps you get in pacing back and forth That's right. this road. Yeah. It's like, Time oh, I just by. walked three miles. Right. I get totally stressed out sending you emails about the weather, whether it's on or not. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. It's just me. Like are you going? Are you going? Okay. Yeah. I'll be there in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then consider getting involved in my spring peeper project. 
which I'm trying to measure and uh, weigh 20 to 25 male spring peepers from concentrated areas because what I've found through some of my research is that the peepers from Dantucket have a higher pitched peep than the ones from the uh, mountains of New Hampshire and there seems to be a gradient in between. My theory is the ones up, up in the mountains are a little bit bigger, they have deeper voices, but I don't know that. There could be something different about their vocal sac, there could be something else uh, that I'm not sure. So I want to start by weighing and measuring them, and if anybody's ever tried to catch peepers, they're not as easy to catch as they should be. You know, when you're hearing them all around you, <laughs> like they should be like, why can't I find them? And now I'm deaf, you know? So, um, but when they're going across the road, they're a lot easier to catch. And we could scoop up a whole bunch, put them in a container, weigh them, measure them, get them back in action. I think it could be pretty easy to do at a place like Fort Pond Road if we have enough people looking for it. That's my uh, contact information, my email address, um, Oxbow Associates, that's where I work. But uh, AMWS, the Association of Massachusetts Wetland Scientists, I'm a big volunteer there. And we're one of the, one of the things we're supposed to do is do some public outreach, like events like this, and let people know that there is a profession out there, wetland scientists, and if they, you know, some younger people, college students, high school kids that might want to get into environmental world, that wetland science is a good way to go. But you have to be able to identify a lot of plants. You have to know something about geology. You have to know something about ecology, or a lot about ecology. But soil. It's like broad science. And soil. Yeah, no, no, science. really. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, amateur wetland scientists. Well, I mean, you can join the organization. If uh, you're just an amateur and you have no credentials, like I was a religion major. Right, but okay. it's a great way to learn. Yeah. You know, you can still go to the meetings. You can learn. Yeah, yeah. And we try to get students involved too. You know, exactly. And they don't. They they might not have any training whatsoever. But you got to start somewhere. Questions? Yes, Scott. What's the most and the fewest uh, amphibians you've seen in a night? Fewest is zero. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember one time I was doing some spotted salamander trapping, and it was like we had like the first three traps, we had 300 spotted salamanders. Oh. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> um, but other, other times I've even seen more than that, you know, but it's, it's usually in really good places with good rainy conditions and, uh, you know, just a, a lot of hours put out there looking around. Um, so, yeah, probably a, maybe even like a thousand, I'm thinking about this night in Western Mass at Stacy Mountain, <clears throat> the, the Nature Conservancy owns near the, near the uh, Connecticut River, west of the Connecticut River, just an amazing place. And all sorts of things going on. That, that's the other thing that you have to do when you're out in the crossing brigade is you have to keep count. So you either need waterproof paper and waterproof pencil or you, what my strategy is because it just gets all wet because it's pouring is um, I just say the number out loud and usually I'm with a partner. And so we, we keep either the same count or my friend keeps one count, I keep another count, but you, you have to keep your count. And we count dead and we count live. Yeah, and you and, yeah count actually, for yeah. species too. So your brain has to, like, a little good brain exercise. I've been really going back and forth on counting the dead. Initially, I'd asked people to count dead, but then I realized everyone's counting the same dead because it's not. That, yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, what I ask is, is if you count a dead, move it. That's why spatulas come in handy. Oh. Or I just do a sweep at the end of my night and see how many dead there is out there. That's you start, yeah. when you're doing your walk, you recognize, I remember that from. I already uh, saw that. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah, I thought about putting some more dead pictures, but that wasn't in the oh, morning. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was even out chalking them, but. Uh. So for your spring peeper project, yeah. um, is it just Fort Pond Road that you're interested in? There's a nice peeper patch um, where Polk Road and Strawberry Hill Road cross. Okay. And it's huge. Yeah. And I, I would rate it number three category where you can't hear individual, you just hear this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but there's no parking. That's that's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. With some of these places, there's no there's no parking. Right, right. It's also, it's also private. 
That's a private property. Right, the, the, the patch itself is private. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to stand there and say, is anybody going to come across the road? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm interested in any place that somebody can find a lot of peepers, but finding 20 to 25 peepers is not that easy. Yeah. Catching, not just hearing. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Scott, could you please comment on the impact of very nice people who are terrified of bugs who have their yards saturated with mosquito spray and tick killer and all this other stuff? Mm -hmm. And the impact, I mean, we know the impact on pollinators, but the impact on amphibians. Well, I mean, those products are, they keep the ingredients they don't tell you exactly what the ingredients are other than they're safe, you know? Right. And so I, without knowing the information on it, I'm not going to comment on it. it, it A it, rock is all natural, but if it's big enough and falls on your head, right. you're going to be dead. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I've heard that they use, uh, you know, chemicals that are uh, ex extracts from, from plants that are deterrents to a lot of these uh, insects. They're not, they don't necessarily kill them. They just, they can't stand being near them. You know, I've heard that, but I'm not an expert in that. And I, I don't know enough about it, but I do know that my neighbors on both sides, I think we have mosquito squad, both of them. And so I've been wondering, like, am I still gonna hear crickets this summer? And I pay right. attention to all the different kinds of crickets that call, you know, behind my house. And I haven't really noticed the difference, to be honest with you. So. And I have noticed, like, wait a second, why aren't, why aren't I getting chewed by mosquitoes, you know? And then I find, oh, they just had their guy come by this afternoon. All right, well, I'm right next door. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know, I'm skeptical that it's not doing anything bad, but I don't know enough about it, so. Well, there's also the use of BTI and... Right, In, that's an aquatic right. larvicide, right? Right, but, yeah. For mosquitoes, right. um, but that that can affect other species as well. But you know, some of those are very specific to dipterans, at least. So it's mm -hmm. just flies, which mosquitoes right. are flies, which is good. That makes makes sense. All right. Well, maybe that's why they're not hurting the crickets. But I just pay attention to the crickets because they call and I like them. You know. Mm -hmm. But well, I'm just like wondering, will the amphibians eat the? Um, subdued larvae yeah. that are dying yeah. and then easier to catch, will they eat them and will the BTI affect their... I th yeah, I mean, that BTI has been around for a long time and I, I think they've done, you know, some studies on it that it's not necessarily great for other invertebrates, but I'm not sure about amphibians, to be honest okay. with you. But, I mean, I'm not, that doesn't mean I'm in, in favor of broadcast spraying every everything that could help with mosquitoes you know I think you got to use it responsibly I had one other question about the fairy shrimp do the fairy shrimp only live in vernal pools or can they live in the little pools that are off a seasonal stream or they're as far as I know they're exclusively in vernal pools Hmm. They have to be in seasonal ponds and they're n never in streams or backwaters mm -hmm. or big lakes. Hmm. Very unique. Hmm. Yes? I mean, back to like the fairy shrimp thing, it like, it depends because like and sometimes there are some species that come out in the autumn, but to answer um, their question, it basically is mainly only a seasonal thing, only pools that have no flow because they swim very elegantly, but <laughs> as you can tell, they aren't very good swimmers when right. it comes to like their speed. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they are elegant. Yep, uh, yep, I agree. All right, any other questions? In terms of the the actual sign up, um, is there, uh, is there a sign up? It, or is it, you know, kind of watch for the night and just show up? <laughs> I've, I, I have an email distribution list. Okay. So I, I can throw your name on it. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. And then um, I'll probably drive it a little crazy around this time of year <laughs> and say, Thursday looks good. And then by Wednesday, eh, I don't know about Thursday. <laughs> and then they, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go out. If it's really good, I'll let you know. And then, but 
Yeah, you get a blast, you know, a flurry yeah. of emails. That, you know, it's a little bit annoying. Delete them after that night goes yeah. by and whatnot. But it's fun, the excitement. But it is, it is fun, yeah. You can also get on the uh, the Vernal Pool Association yeah. listserv if, if you really want to make yourself crazy. If you really want and, to. And, you, know, you know, the people from Rhode Island will start reporting and then, yeah. you know, Connecticut yeah. will start moving up and they yeah. pass here and they get up into New Hampshire. Yeah. yeah. Today, was getting all excited. a lot of emails. I had to delete quite well, a lot. it's fun, you know, if you're into this sort of thing, then you know what's going on. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, it does make you feel part of a community. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And there's all sorts of interesting characters that are interested in this sort of yeah. stuff. So. They do some very deep dives on that you know, whole association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into the hydras and the mosses. Right. They yes. look very fragile. You know, their little fingers are so delicate. Do they, um, you know, does it hurt them to walk across the, the asphalt? The asphalt, yeah. I don't think so. No, they're very, uh, they, yeah, they're used to rocks and being underneath things. And, yeah. But, but, uh, yeah, did you want to talk about, or would you talk about the, the rest of the habitat year for salamanders? Because they're in dry woods. Right, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah, so they're only in the ponds for like less than 5% of their entire lives, right? The rest of the time, the salamanders are like underground using burrows dug by other animals, shrews and moles and mice, chipmunks maybe. Um, and the wood frogs are hopping around the surface of the leaf litter, um, but not necessarily underground, but you will find them underneath cover objects and that sort of thing. And they'll spend the whole time underground, and then when it does rain in the summer and the fall, they will come out to the surface to feed a little bit more, and then go back down into those burrows. Um, but they'll go for 500 feet, 1,000 feet away from the ponds uh, for their summertime ranges. And then a lot of times they'll come back closer in the fall, so they'll be kind of stage closer to the pool, getting ready for the spring migration, but not all of them, you know, it depends on the individuals. But yeah, they spend most, they're mostly upland animals, you know. And those areas are mostly animals. unprotected. Right. By, by regulation. They're outside the buffer zone, yeah. unfortunately, but yeah. What's their lifespan? Uh, what species are you? Oh, I guess frogs, most yeah, frogs, that word. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those, uh, wood frogs may only live uh, five to ten years. I think in some places, I'm guessing they would live longer than that, but I'm not totally sure. But like I think I said about the salamanders, I've done some what they call skeletal chronology with those where you take a toe slice and then you can slice that, put it underneath the microscope and stain it the right way, and then you can see the growth rings on the bones. Mm -hmm. And they're like 25 to 35 years old, some of those spotted salamanders, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, so they can they can live quite long. Mm -hmm. And toads probably the same, 30, 40 years old sometimes, the big toads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the road salt having an impact on them? It can't be good for them. Yeah, I mean, there are some studies, I was just reading one the other day, about a road salt in vernal pools mm -hmm. and how that affects egg development, mm -hmm. which it does. Um, and then the terrestrial environment, yeah, it can affect that too. But, <clears throat> you know, it seems like I, I see a lot of pools that are right next to roads and they still seem to have pretty productive uh, populations. And so I'm not sure what to make of it exactly. I don't know if it's a doomsday scenario every time. <coughs> There's a movie theater in Framingham on uh, Flutie Pass, or maybe it's a Natick more spring peepers than I've heard anywhere else. Yeah. And it's surrounded by Route 9, Route 30, mm. the driveway to the movie theater. Yeah. Somehow, yeah. they thrive in there. Yeah. <laughs> For years you've heard them? And uh, I just heard them once. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, in situations like that, right after they build. But that sounds like something that's been there for a while, right? Or is it new? Um, it's been there a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I always thought, think, think, think that's interesting from like a reverse conservation perspective. Like, whoa, wait a second. Not that we want to come up to a project where we come away and say, spring peepers love pavement and parking and traffic. They seem to do great. There's a correlation here. You know? we don't, I don't want to get involved in that. But if they can survive on in there, what do they have in there? That, that's all they need, obviously, right? If they're living here.
year after year in there. So that is interesting in some perspectives. But there also may have been wood frogs and salamanders in there that aren't there anymore, too. That's very true, yeah. Do you have any idea of the maximum distance from the vernal pool that, you know, they'll go and live for the rest of, like, they're mole salamanders, yeah. so they kind of go underground. How far will they walk away before they'll be like, this is a cool place uh, to spend the winter? <laughs> and so this, mostly within 600 feet of the pools, okay. but it can be twice that. Yeah. Yeah. Can anyone take the little guys to? I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, they can move. And it might be more than one night that it takes them to do it. And I think marbled salamanders will move further, too. Yeah, so, but a thousand feet, but definitely like within 600 feet is, they say, like 90 something percent of most of the salamanders. Yeah, and the frogs there. are funny, too, because, like, you'll be like, oh no, there's one, and you're going to go to pick it up, and then he jumps, and then you go to pick it up, and he jumps, and he jumps, and he jumps, and you follow him across the street, and then there'll be another one, and you'll be like, and he just doesn't move at all. And he <laughs> Really you'll lose all your dignity out there. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else will too. So. Yeah. Is the moral of the story to go in pairs? It's fun to go with a partner. Yeah, it's yeah. better. It's better. That's for sure. Yeah, it's scary and lonely to be out there all by yourself. Mm -hmm. It is when, when I'm the only person. But yeah, yeah it's also, creepy. Yeah, yeah, the board owls are out there on Fort Con. You'll, you'll hear those at night and other stuff going by. But. <laughs> and the ghost of Sarah Devlin. <laughs> if you think you're going to be all by yourself, send me an email. I'll try to go. Oh, okay. Especially Arlington. Yeah, I'm, I'm the Arlington person. Because I feel like if I've been going there for the same amount of years, I could be helping the same salamander. <laughs> That's a really nice point. <laughs> Put a little beeper on the back. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, is there any kind of advice on, um, uh, like the order of how you should do things, like should you move the animal across the road first and then take a picture and record it and weigh it or whatever it is you're going to do, or should you do that in situ, like where you find it and then help them cross the road? That's like, a good question. Uh, depends on the traffic. Yeah, get yourself out of traffic you know, first. So I guess the priority is to, the reason why we're out there is to keep them from getting run over, right? Mm -hmm. So that is imminent. Get it out of the road, you know that's fine. But we, the the weighing and that sort of thing, that's going to take a little time. You know, that's not something we want to do in the middle of the road. You know, that would be something we collect a few and then have a little workstation deal with it there. Um, but the the <coughs> movement and the note taking, you know, that's another thing you want to keep that in mind. Like, okay, this is two wood frogs that we're moving to the act inside, so you got to make sure you note that as soon as you get that over with, and then move on after that and be careful on the shoulders because when you go to bring them over you have to remember that other people have put them or they've just leapt over and now they're kind of on the edge of the yeah. leaf litter and so if you go traipsing up there you could step on them. right that's true or there could be some coming the other way yeah 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 mm -hmm. good all right do we have like a sign-up sheet you, you have some notes over here if anybody I didn't wants to sign up. wants to leave an email to get on, on the distribution yeah. list or whatever, by all means. Or the Weed Warrior list. Yeah, yeah the Weed Warrior. And we're also having a, a town wide garlic mustard pool on Earth Day. Yeah. But you'll be seeing stuff for that too. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Amy, yeah. is the Weed Warrior, is this um, consistent with CISMA? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All, right. all right, well, thank you very much for coming. Maybe Thursday. Maybe Thursday.